Okay, uh, so speaking of awesome, um, I get to introduce Danny Meyer as the final speaker of the Welcome Conference. Um, if you were at the conference last year, uh, you saw, and I think you feel it even today, that his uh, teachings, who he is, the company that he's built, everything that he's talked about, um, is just intertwined in every single thing that everyone is saying. And we are truly here today and last year continuing a conversation that he started in 1985 when he opened Union Square Cafe. Um, I think that was the day or that was the year or rather maybe that was just the time that it stopped being about food and service and it started being about food and hospitality. I worked for him for years. Um, and then I got to work with him for years. And to be clear, when I say I worked with him, I was still working for him. But that's just the way he always made it feel. We talk about a lot of things in our company centered around ownership and engagement. And well, those and honestly, everything that I do and believe in is based on the foundation that I got from him. Um, last year, I spoke here and I talked about the importance of being emotional. And I talked about how I learned that from my mom. And that's true. I learned how to be emotional and why it's so important to be emotional in life from my mom. But I learned that it's OK. And in fact, it transcends being OK. It is right. And it is powerful. And it is just liberating to be emotional at work, too. And I learned that from this man. Um, he's my mentor. He's someone that I've admired for my, well, my entire career and feel so fortunate to have gotten to work for and with. And I'm just overwhelmed that he's here uh, to take us home. So please give a really warm round of applause. Listen, I'm really sorry I'm not dancing up here, but I just have been so moved by you. You want to talk about emotion? You're the man. Oh, yeah, all right. Um, and I, I also want to say I am so motivated by everyone in this room. This is why we do what we do. It's a community of people who come to work every single day really believing that if you give from your heart, you're going to get back many fold from doing that. Now, here's the problem, Mr. Will and Mr. Anthony, Mr. Dan. I, I can't get used to saying Will and Anthony. It's always Will and Daniel. But you made me take the pole position today. So I had this whole kind of idea about what I was going to talk about today. You guys already said it all. Now, this sort of reminds me of of a fantastic expression, by the way, that I got from the governor of Colorado, John Hickenlooper, when he was the mayor of Denver. And he came to see Shake Shack in 2005. Shake Shack was one year old. And he had heard about Shake Shack. And he wanted to have something like this for whatever the, what's the big park in downtown Denver? City Park. City Park. City park. OK. So it was real dangerous, and he said, why can't we have something that, that takes a dangerous park and makes it feel great for people to come? And I got a call from a woman you may have, many of you have probably heard called the Gabby Gourmet. And she said, would you by any chance be willing to take a meeting with the mayor of Denver? He's a former restaurateur. He used to make beer. He gets all the stuff that you guys are doing. I said, well, who the hell wouldn't? Of course I'd be happy to. So he comes to Shake Shack, and it's one of these days in uh, in March, where New Yorkers have been cooped up all winter long, and finally we get like a 60 degree day. So the line goes all the way to Fifth Avenue. He's like, what the hell are you guys putting in those burgers? He, <laughs> he was getting interesting ideas for when he would become governor about what to put in the burgers. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I said, honestly, they're just, you know, it's really good beef. and. Um, you know, we're trying to smile and make people feel welcome here, but I'm just as pleased as punch. I honestly don't know why everybody's 
standing in line like this. And he, he, so he says, hmm, that's interesting. So he takes a bite of his first Shack burger, and he was like, this is really good. And he said, I think I know what's going on here. And this is what I'm trying to do today to start my talk with you guys, which is, he said, this reminds me of a conversation I had with my history professor when I went to Wesleyan. And I wrote a paper, and I didn't feel very good about it. And I got the best grade I've ever gotten. And the history professor says to me afterwards, he says, you know, everything has already been said, but not everything has been said superbly. And even if it had been, everything must be said freshly over and over again. And what I loved about that, he was relating that to the burger. Of course, we didn't invent a burger. And of course, none of us in this room has invented anything that we do. We didn't invent hospitality. We didn't invent leading with your heart. We didn't invent being right or being wrong or, or anything like that. But by doing it freshly and looking at each day as an opportunity to do it maybe a little bit more superbly than it had been done yesterday, there's beauty in that. And there's beauty in bringing a whole team of people with you on that pursuit. And so, Will and Anthony, for having this vision to do that, you are bringing all kinds of, hate to use that word, but awesome people with you on that pursuit. And there's no one who will have spent these hours today together who will leave here without being really, really enriched by the connections that have been made. So I want to start by just thanking you guys very, very much. I also just want to say how incredibly envious I am, both of Will and, and Amy Mills, who get to do this in front of their parents, because that's a, that's a really, really special treat uh, for, for everybody involved. And thanks to you parents as well. You guys are awesome. Okay. So. I'm having a conversation with my family on Friday night, and uh, we're talking about today. And I was talking about the Welcome Conference. And what does that mean? And I, I did the best I could to explain what it meant. And, and I said, and there's this, this topic called being right. And, and they said, well, OK, cool. So what's your talk going to be about? And I said, well, my talk is called The Irrelevancy of Being Right, whereupon my Yale daughter says, that's wrong. <laughs> the word is irrelevance, not irrelevancy. <laughs> so <laughs> so what, what would you do in that situation if you were me? Take this guy out, and you Google the word irrelevancy to see if, if if it actually exists in the real world, because I want to be right. <laughs> and then I said, wait, now I'm in trouble because I care about being right, but the whole point was that it's irrelevancy to be right. <laughs> so the good news is that irrelevancy is a word, and the meaning of irrelevancy is irrelevance. <laughs> go, go figure. But I'm going to use both of those words in Scrabble. It just depends on if I get an extra E or a Y. It doesn't really matter. But here's why I wanted to, to talk about the irrelevancy of being right. I'm going to tell you a couple stories. Um, I'm going to, is, is Alan Richmond in the crowd by any chance? Did you, good. I'm, I'm going to give you the opportunity to be the subject of one of my stories for a change. <laughs> so. I'm going to guess this was about uh, eight or nine years ago or so. And we're always really, really grateful when we open a brand new restaurant or when a brand new chef begins at one of our existing restaurants. And we're really, really grateful when people actually want to come see what we're doing. Especially grateful if within, say, the first day or so, one of those people is a restaurant critic. Because <laughs> we're all very, very ready to, you know, we, we know that just like a wine that's been put in the cask, it's, it's never going to taste any better than this, is it? <laughs> right? <laughs> so, 
so sure enough, um, <laughs> one of the people who took a really wonderful early interest in Gramercy Tavern, um, I think it was actually about two days after Tom Colicchio had left and Mike Anthony was just getting suited up to see if the chef's whites would work in our very dark kitchen with all those knives and everything. <laughs> and, and lo and behold, um, and by the way, I, I do want to say, I am not, this is true, I am not a restaurateur who thinks he is a bad writer. This is one of the best writers you will ever see. I just don't always love what it is he's writing. Um, <laughs> But no, that man knows what to do with the word, all right. So the review comes out, um, and the entire review is based on a menu that was not Mike Anthony's menu. Because one of the things I insist on as a restaurateur is that while it's fresh in people's minds that there's a new chef around, maybe give the chef, this is what I want to do, give the chef a month or two to kind of understand the rhythms of the restaurant and what the guests like to eat and which cooks can cook as well as the chef wants them to cook without having to go through the, the process of changing the entire menu overnight. So the review comes out and um, it was maybe not as scathing as the one you wrote about New Orleans, but you know, kind of close to that. And unfortunately, the review was based on Tom Colicchio's former menu and not the menu that Mike would put in place. So I knew that being right was irrelevant right here because Alan Richman or any critic, because that's their job, our job is to produce, a critic's job is to criticize. My kids taught me that a long time ago. Dad, if, after I saw some review from the New York Times many years ago, there's a reason they're not called restaurant praisers. <laughs> you know? um, but, he had absolutely every right to critique that meal, and I took about a minute or two feeling really, really bad for Mike Anthony because here he is, and if, if it's your first week and you're stepping into an institution like Gramercy Tavern with big shoes left by Tom Colicchio, that's a really tough thing to then just get slammed for a menu that's not even your menu. But it didn't matter if that was right or that was wrong. And if I'm not mistaken, I wrote Alan a note after that, and, I, and you know what, Alan, you may think that it's wrong to turn the other cheek, but I actually thought that the right thing to do was to turn the other cheek, give you the benefit of the doubt, and here's what's happened. This was really cool. Four months after this, my wife Audrey and I are, are invited to an anniversary party of some really good friends. And my wife's best friend, who we're seated next to, has a date with Alan Richmond that night. <laughs> the right thing for me to do was to turn the other cheek and not talk about who was right and who was wrong. That is the irrelevancy of being right. Well written, but wait till you try Mike Anthony's food now. It's really good. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Here's another story. Probably the first time in my entire career I learned about the irrelevancy of being right. This is about, this goes back a long ways, almost 30 years, because Union Square Cafe will be 30 years old this October 21st. About three months into Union Square Cafe's existence, when I started to just really understand how much fun it was to sell wine to people, especially this new breed of people that I had never really encountered before called investment bankers. <laughs> I didn't even know what they did. I really had no idea, except one thing I knew is that every time we had an investment banker in the house, they bought the most expensive wine on the list. So I would start to salivate whenever I heard there was an investment banker in. And back then, um, a really expensive bottle of wine at Union Square Cafe was $35, $40. And as a matter of fact, we were selling Sancerre for 12 bucks a bottle. We were selling Beaujolais for 14 bucks a bottle. How frustrating is it that you can't get a decent Beaujolais for under $80 these days? It's ridiculous, but we'll leave that for another occasion. So this group of investment bankers comes into the restaurant. There's, there's eight of them, biggest table we had. And the guy who had now been there for uh, four visits, so he, that qualified as a regular three months into the restaurant, 
knew his name and everything, was clearly trying to impress his, his table. And he asked me to bring over our best Chardonnay. This was going to be good because we had just gotten in a Premier Cru Merceau, which was on the list for $45. Imagine that, $45. <laughs> Maybe by the half glass these days. <laughs> And so I proudly brought that to the table. You know, we're going to make a lot of money tonight. And he looks at me and he says, that's not a Chardonnay. And I said, it is a Chardonnay. And at this point, he goes, it's not a Chardonnay. And then he looks at all the people at the table. And they're all nodding with him and everything. And I feel about that big and everything. And I've got my grandfather in my ear saying the customer's always right. And I've got my wine teacher from L'Académie du Vin in this year saying, of course it's a Chardonnay. There's only one white Burgundy that's not a Chardonnay made by Ponceau. Is that right, you master sommeliers here? Is that right? Anyway, we'll talk about that another time as well. <laughs> but this, this was a Chardonnay. And this goes back and forth about three times. And finally, I go, I know what I'm going to do. I just leave the table, and I go back, and I get the Sonoma Coutrier Le Pierre, $35 instead of $45, bring it to him at the table, and he goes, now that's a Chardonnay. <laughs> the most important lesson I think I've learned in my entire professional career happened right then, three months into being in business, in terms of the irrelevancy of being right. I wasn't right, he wasn't right, he was wrong, I was wrong, it didn't matter. No one's ever right. No one's always right, that's for sure. The only thing that was truly relevant is he needed to feel heard. And what I needed to have done at that very moment, which I trust I've done in every situation that's ever come up since that point in time, was simply to say, when, when he said, this is not a Chardonnay, is to forget what's right and what's wrong, and simply to say, sounds like you'd like a California Chardonnay. And he would have said, thank you. And so the whole point is, is that we waste so much energy, so much effort on being right. Earlier you heard um, Will was talking about uh, the notion of, of how often sometimes convenience and sometimes laziness gets in the way of the generosity of spirit that sometimes is shielded by the shield I call being right. Being right can be used as the most dangerous shield in the world of hospitality, and I would say of life. Think about life in general. Think about religion. How many wars have been fought in the name of religion? You name one religion that doesn't believe that its way is the right way. If, if that religion is the right way, or that one is the right way, or that one is the right way, someone's wrong. So think about not only the irrelevancy of being right, but think about the danger of trying to be right. I remember many, many years ago at 11 Madison Park, we had a policy. Every restaurant has policies. We had policy every single restaurant I've ever worked at. And the policy at 11 Madison Park had to do with the number of bottles of wine you were able to bring in before we would say, no more. So stiff corkage fee for bottle one and bottle two. And at bottle number three, take it home with you, because we're not going to open it at that point. Now, a restaurant has a policy because it's to prevent all hell from breaking loose, right? We had a similar policy years ago at Gramercy Tavern. We will never serve any tavern food in the dining room, never. We have that policy. And it's a really simple thing to take out that shield of being right and tell a guest, sorry, that's our policy. We don't do that. And guess what happens when you take out that shield? The guest winds up and hits you so hard that your policy ends up costing the chaos it was trying to prevent. Now, I'm not up here to tell you not to have policies in your restaurants, because there's a good reason generically for every single one of them. But I would say that the best way to use a policy is to think of it more as a guideline and to use it as an opportunity to break that policy in the name of hospitality. 
Let me get back to the 11 Madison Park story for just a moment. Person comes in, I, I wasn't there that night, but boy did I see the letter the next day. And this happens to be an investment banker. You guys are gonna think I have a thing with investment bankers here. And he said in his letter that he was going to write every single person he knew, and he almost started listing all the people he knew, and they were all in open tables, so you could see he was, you know, and he was gonna make sure that not only would they never go back to 11 Madison Park, but they would never go to any of our restaurants because of this policy with the wine. And do I have any idea what a compliment it was that all of those people would have brought wines of that stature to drink with our food and to spend all that money in the restaurant. And I gave the opportunity to respond to him, to our team, because they were the people responsible for, for what had happened. And I always feel like the best way to learn is not to have me come in on a cape and try to come save the day, but get it done. So the more he pushed back, the more we pushed back. And the more he pushed back, the more we pushed back. And this thing got to the point where we're now emailing the entire, the entire city of investment bankers. <laughs> I'm now starting to hear from managers at our other restaurants saying, this person has just been in, and he says it's the last time he's coming here because of this incident that happened at the restaurant. And I'm going, didn't I write a chapter in setting the table called The Road to Success is Paved with Mistakes Well Handled? How in the world have we turned this one policy into a mistake that keeps begetting more and more and more and more mistakes? And I realized that being right was the thing that was motivating the behavior of so many people on our team. And they knew it, but they had gotten themselves so entrenched, it was almost like the US being in Vietnam or something, where you just keep making mistakes and you back yourself into a corner and then pride starts to take over. And it gets so far away from why we are in this business in the first place, which is as simple as figure out how someone feels when they walk in the door, do some stuff to them over the course of two or three hours and make sure they feel a little happier when they leave. Isn't that kind of what we're here to do? And we had done completely the opposite. So. 15 emails back and forth later. Finally, we make peace. I have to go have a bottle of wine with this person at Maialino and break bread together and make peace, which of course we do. It then leads to um, a good outcome. So the road to success is paved with mistakes well handled because this is the person who ended up buying the mosaic artwork off the walls at Tabla when Tabla went out of business, and now this artwork lives in this person's home. It had a happy ending, but can you imagine the amount of energy that went into being right instead of just doing the right thing in the first place? And we're all capable of so much more than that. I want to conclude by, by talking about what's What's wrong about being right? And what is a better way of being right? And how we got to this place. Being right is how I grew up being told to be. As a matter of fact, anyone in this room who grew up before the internet was someone who was educated based on getting the right answer to a question. Because today, you don't have to have the right answer to a question. It's completely irrelevant. As a matter of fact, if you want to know the right way to drive from here to Poughkeepsie, turn on your GPS. If you really want to know the right way, turn on Waze. <laughs> OK? But the answer is there for you. If you want to know if irrelevancy is right or wrong compared to irrelevance, go to the internet. It's all there. If you want to know the answer to a mathematical problem, take out your smartphone. You can figure the whole thing out. So being right was something that we were taught was the ultimate pinnacle of knowledge. And there's a reason culturally that so many of us care so deeply 
about being right. But it's time to get rid of that because it is no longer the currency that separates who does the really good work in life from who doesn't. Because right now there's no excuse to not get the knowledge stuff right. It's there for everybody to have. And so the really awesome part about this whole thing, at a conference it's about welcome, at a conference it's about hospitality, is that we do have to be right with respect to the things that people expect us to do well. There is absolutely no excuse for any of us to run businesses where people expect them to be clean and for us to respect their time in terms of how long things take. And I mean, it's, it's ridiculous at this point with all the technology we have not to get the right food to the right person at the right table, at the right temperature, at the right time, not to remember what people are, are allergic to, not to remember who their favorite server is or what their table is. All that stuff is knowable and it doesn't even rely upon our brains to do it. But you've heard an expression over and over today, which is the expression of generosity. And you've also heard about the hospitality heart today. And just as you could see in a championship swimmer, someone who's got really long feet, almost like built-in flippers, or you could see in John, John Batiste, who's an obviously an athletic musician, a hand. Did anyone notice his hand? If that man was not born to play keyboards, I don't know who was. But what you could see in Tim, and what you can see in every single person in this room, is the athletic heart of a true hospitality professional. Somebody who, for whatever reason, was born with the equipment to be generous. And if there's one thing that frustrates me more than anything about the notion of being right, it's that being right too often gets in the way of being generous. Because being right is too often used as a way to protect us from doing the thing that will actually most serve us. And if I can leave you with one thought, forget being right. It's completely fucking irrelevant. 